Once again, Romans chapter 10 for our scripture reading. In our call to worship, we noted the wonderful statement there in Romans chapter 10 and verse 13. For whoever whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. It is an invitation, beloved, that goes to you and me. The word whoever is indefinite, it's universal. But Paul then asks a series of questions after making that statement in verse 13. And they are logically related to one another. In Romans 10 and verse 14, he says, How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? And you look at that text and you work back logically, link by link. It starts in verse 15 with God sending into the world preachers through the centuries and they do preach and then there is hearing and then there is believing in Christ and then there's calling on Christ and then there is salvation. So preaching to the world probably seems like a foolish type thing and A rather weak thing, I mean, a mortal sinner proclaiming truth, and you've got to be kidding. That is how people are saved? No, I'm not kidding. Paul's not kidding either. Paul declares that that is, generally speaking, how God through the centuries has determined to work through the foolishness of the message preached. It is a very astounding thing that God comes to us human beings and he comes in a rather humble form and God condescends and speaks through mere men. It is astounding when you stop to think about it. But that is how God has determined to work. We all know this by experience. We who are saved here this morning, this is how You and I came to know the Lord Jesus Christ through simple proclamation. Someone, somewhere, sometime was preaching. It's probably how you were saved, probably. So we're thinking, if you note the outline this morning, about preachers of the word. And we're taking a large chunk and... um, I suppose I I could, uh, the three sections have done it 30 minutes per section. Sometimes it's advantageous to to get a large chunk. And um, we're in Mark chapter 6, and all of these sections deal with preachers. Jesus was a preacher, the apostles were preachers, and John the Baptist was a preacher. And... There's different ways to tie this whole passage together. One way to tie it together is the issue of faith. And faith is so important, and yet we find that there are people who will hear the clearest proclamation. I mean, Jesus Christ could be here this morning in this pulpit. Let's pretend he came and proclaimed the truth with utter precision and clarity and beauty. And there could be someone here this morning who would walk out in unbelief. It is astounding. I know we are amazed by it, but it is true. Jesus himself could be here this morning. And you could have a man or a woman. He would say, that's not for me. I don't believe that. God is for you, but it's not for me. And that is exactly what happened when Jesus went to Nazareth, his hometown. 
He had already been performing miracles. He had already been preaching. This is fairly early in his ministry. He already has disciples, 12 men whom he has chosen. And he comes home. And they don't believe. This whole matter of unbelief is a very mystifying thing. Because unbelief will place a person in hell for eternity. John chapter 3 is very clear about that. Everything hinges on faith in order to be saved. But people do not believe. It is an astounding, mystifying thing. And Jesus is flabbergasted in this passage. He does not fully understand it as to his humanity. He doesn't even get it as to his humanity. Let's look at the passage. Mark 6, verse 1. Talking about Jesus. Then he went out from there and came to his own country, and his disciples followed him. And when the Sabbath had come, this is the Jewish Sabbath, Saturday, he began to teach in the synagogue. Now, remember, that's basically what Jesus does. He basically does two things. He teaches slash preaches, and he heals people. He casts out demons. Basically two things before the cross. The cross is why he really came, but teaching is at the heart of what Jesus does. He's the greatest teacher who ever lived. Light shines off of him. Precision, simplicity, accuracy, infallibility, inerrancy. This is who is teaching in Nazareth. Of course, he would have been teaching the scripture, Old Testament. And many hearing him were astonished, saying, Where did this man get these things? And what wisdom is this which is given to him that such mighty works are performed by his hands? They are amazed. They cannot deny this 30-year-old is, is a man who is filled with wisdom and he's been performing miracles. They do not deny it. They're not so foolish as the liberals who deny that Jesus performed miracles. <coughs> And they just can't get a hold of this. And remembering Jesus when he was a kid, he grew up in Nazareth. He ran down the streets. He played. He was a boy. Played the games, no doubt, that the other kids were playing. And in his 20s, he was a carpenter. Now he's a great rabbi. I mean, he never went to school in Jerusalem. Where does he get all of this wisdom from? Of course, he's anointed with the Spirit, and this is Messiah, which explains everything. Verse 3. Is this not the carpenter? The son of Mary? I mean, his brothers and sisters are here. It's, they're scandalized by him. He's got four brothers, James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon, at least two sisters. Mary had lots of kids after Jesus. Are not his sisters here with us? So they were offended at him. They were scandalized in the Greek. They were scandalized. They fell over him. There's no faith. No faith. It's an amazing thing. People can have the truth in their hands. They can be raised in the Christian faith. They can hear the gospel thousands of times in their lives. And some have no faith. It is a mystery. Verse 4, Jesus refers to a proverbial saying here. But Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his own country, among his own relatives, and in his own house. Do you realize his brothers didn't believe in him at this point? Now they'll believe later on. These, these two great men, James and Jude, become writers in the New Testament. They did not believe at that point. You say, how important is it that I have faith, that you and I have faith in our lives. 
How important is this? Now look at this statement, and we must not, we must not explain it away. We must let the statement stand in the full force. It is a statement about the God-man. It is striking because we're talking about the God-man who is able to do everything. You know, God is able to do anything, whatever he wants. God is able to do it. But there's something that can stop God. I know it almost sounds like blasphemy, but it is not. Because of this text. Notice what it says. Now he, when we're talking about Messiah, Son of God, a divine person, he could do no mighty work there. Do you mean to say that God was not able to do something? Yes, that is what Mark is saying. That God was not able to do a mighty work there, a mighty miracle there in Nazareth, except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. Now, why was this the case? What stopped the hand of God from reaching down? And what's going to stop the hand of God from reaching down to help you and me? You know what it is? It's if you and I have unbelief. We read in verse 6, and he marveled because of their unbelief. That was the problem. That is why he could do no mighty work there. It was because of their unbelief. There was unbelief in their hearts, and that restrained the hand of God, and God, as it were, could not intervene and could not act. That is precisely what the text says. Verse 5, he could do no mighty work there. Verse 6, because of their unbelief. Our unbelief stops the hand of God. Now, let's look at James. Just maybe stick your bullet in there and look at James chapter 1. James was there in Nazareth. James did not believe at that point, but later James comes to faith in Jesus. This is his brother, his half-brother, James chapter 1. It is interesting. Now James is a saved man. People can be changed. You and I can change from what we once were. And God can use you and me. And James chapter 1 and verse 1 says, James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. James is now a saved man. He is a servant. He is a bondservant of the Lord Jesus Christ. And by the way, that is his brother. It's an amazing thing to think about. But he's more than a brother. He is the Lord. He is God. Now look at this. James chapter 1. Notice if you would, verse 5. And there could be other issues here. You could apply this beyond the issue of a need for wisdom. James 1, 5. If any of you lacks wisdom. And by the way, let's face it. That's all of us. You ever feel like, man, I, I don't know what the answer is to this problem. This problem is, is too complex. I don't know what the answer is. Well, that's what it means to be a human being. You don't know everything. We, I don't know everything. Lots of times you and I lack wisdom. He says in verse 5, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God. Go and pray to God. Now, what kind of God do we have? He says, who gives to all liberally and without reproach. God's not going to be mad at you for asking. He's not going to reproach you. He gives to all liberally. Think about how great and how wonderful God is. He says, let him ask of God and it will be given to him. But now notice, when you and I pray... And there are times when you and I struggle with unbelief. Otherwise, he would not have written this. If nobody struggled with unbelief, he would not write this. He says, but let him ask in faith. If you're going to ask something of, of God, make sure that you ask in faith. And that means, he says, with no doubting. Don't be doubting God. 
Don't doubt the goodness of God. What is a doubter like? He says, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. You doubt, if you and I doubt, we, James says, you and I are unstable. We're just pushed here and there, pushed here and there like the waves of the sea. For, for let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. If you and I have a doubting, you know, we're praying to God. And we're thinking, no, I, don't really, I really don't think you have the ability to do this. Even while we're praying, but you really don't believe he has the ability to do this. Well, he says, let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. For he is a double-minded man. He believes and he doesn't believe. He believes, he, he doesn't believe. He believes and he doubts. He believes and he doubts. He's double-minded. Two minds. I mean, which is he? Which is it? He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. And so he says we have to ask in faith. Ask in faith. Beloved, ask in faith. Well, we come back to Mark 6. Jesus needs help. This is amazing. Jesus needs help. Jesus is a strategist. You know, he's one preacher, but we need more preachers. You know, we try to expand the kingdom of God. We're trying here, the consistory, the elders, the deacons, we're all we're trying to expand, but you have to strategize and think it through. And, you know, there's just one preacher here that I know of, okay? Jesus is just one preacher, so, okay, he needs more preachers. And that's what is going on here. He's spreading the announcement, but he needs more preachers. God needs preachers. And so we read, we're at Mark 6, verse 6b, and then he went about the villages in a circuit teaching. Again, but there's just one man. He needs more men. Now, he's selected his 12 already, and they've been spending time with Jesus, getting to know him, and that's in Mark chapter 3. And this is the great thing about Jesus. He knows that his preachers are just men and that his preachers need encouragement. And so that's why he sends them out by two. That's, it's a good thing, by the way, for a preacher to be married, to have a wife. She can encourage the preacher. Well, these men weren't married yet, so you gotta do it this way. You gotta have two men. These, these men are in their 20s, they're young, they're not married yet. But now notice this, verse seven, and he called the 12 to himself and began to send them out two by two. These guys, these guys are gonna have bad days. I and mean, if you have another man there, another apostle, he can encourage him and lift him up. Yeah, it was a terrible sermon you preached, but next time you'll do better. Encouragement. He sent them out two by two. And now notice, these preachers need help. They need strength from God and gave them power. Preachers need, listen, preachers need supernatural strength from God. You know why? Because there is intense demonic opposition. He gave them power over unclean spirits. Now, this is real. It is a real thing. I'm not making this up. There's intense demonic opposition to preachers. Any preacher will tell you this. But there's the Holy Spirit who is more powerful. Now, we all need to learn at times total dependence on God. <laughs> Now, this is risky business. This is risky for these men because they're going out with nothing on this preaching mission. It wasn't always this way. If you look at Luke 22, 35 and 38, sometimes they would take stuff with them, food and money. And I think the apostles did that in the book of Acts. But this is a unique preaching tour. And you're going out with nothing. And you have to depend upon your hearers to supply all of your needs. Therefore, you must be humble 
And you must depend upon God for everything. Imagine the challenge of this. Man, this is risky business. Okay. Are you sure, Lord? I'd really like to have some money on this, this expedition, like a credit card. $10,000 credit. And you're saying none of that? Not on this mission. Look at verse 8. He commanded them to take nothing for the journey except a staff. And I wonder if that's a weapon against wild animals. I'm just wondering because in Luke 22, he allows them to carry swords. The apostles carrying daggers? Yeah, they had two among them. Self protection. I'm wondering if that's part of this protection, these wild animals and things like that. I don't know for sure to help them walk. Yes, but it'd be a nice weapon as well. But notice, no bag, no traveling bag for food, no bread, no copper in their money belts, but to wear sandals and not to put on two tunics. You are to live like everybody else who has one tunic and don't present yourself as being wealthy with two tunics. You're a man among men. You're going to go into these houses and you need to depend on other people. Also, he said to them, in whatever place you enter a house, stay there till you depart from that place. Now, look at this. Now, here Jesus is sobering these men up right away. You men are carrying the gospel and the opportunity for salvation for souls. All who believe your message will be saved eternally. But I want you to know something. There can be a lot of people who don't believe. I'm just warning you ahead of time. And notice what he says. And whoever will not receive you nor hear you, that's the way it's going to go. I believe it's true. You and I know this. There are people who will not receive us. There will be people who will not hear us. And he says, I want you to do something. When you depart from there, shake off the dust under your feet as a testimony against them. They are going to come under the judgment of God and you disassociate yourself from them entirely. Just shake off the dust of your feet and back off from them. They're going to come under the judgment of God. Now there's a day of judgment coming. And Jesus talks about this as we keep reading. And, you know, Jesus talks about Sodom and Gomorrah, and we all know from Genesis what was going on in Sodom and Gomorrah. Sodom and Gomorrah was a place filled with Sodomites. Apart from repentance, Sodomites come under the wrath of God. Now, you can be saved. 1 Corinthians 6, there were Sodomites saved. But it's going to be worse for these particular cities on this occasion. Notice how emphatic Jesus is because they, you see, had more light. These are the apostles of Christ who are coming. They had more light. And so this is an astounding statement when you think about it, how it's going to go on the final day of judgment in terms of these cities versus the Sodomites in that perversion. Jesus says, As surely I say to you, it will be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. It's going to go worse because they had more light. So he sends them out preaching. What a, what a wonderful message this is. The message of repentance is a, is a message of good news. Jesus says, if you change your thinking, you'll be saved. Meta. Noia, a total change of thought, a total embrace of a new worldview, the embrace of Christ, and you will be saved. I tell you, that is good news that God will save me if I repent. And I can go to heaven. And notice verse 12, so they went out and preached that people should repent, and they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and healed them. Now, we come to 
our third preacher, that is John the Baptist. And we're coming to a very, very bad man, Herod Antipas. Notice verse 14. You know, the conscience, listen, you think about hell, you know, one of the, the miseries in hell is not just the fire, but it's the haunting of the conscience and the accusations of the conscience and the remorse of a, of a bad life, the remorse of unbelief, which will haunt a person for eternity. Oh, man, that's hell in itself, even apart from the fire. And his conscience it started to bother him. Verse 14, now King Herod heard of him for his name had become well known. And he said, John the Baptist is risen from the dead and therefore these powers are at work in him. Now, look, again, the liberals deny that the fact that there was actual a dynamism and a power exerted in the Son of God. Herod Antipas was no fool at that point. There were powers at work in him. The Gospels are clear about that. This is the Son of God. Power. No denying his power. He thinks it's John the Baptist. Some say Elijah, some the prophet there in Deuteronomy 18 or one of the prophets. And you notice that his conscience is haunting him. Conscience for the reprobate is never going to let up. Never. What a haunting thing. Verse 14, but when Herod heard this, he said, this is John whom I beheaded. He has been raised from the dead. For Herod himself had sent and laid hold of John and bound him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, for he had married her. This is a man who... You know, we're hearing about Hollywood this past week or two. And we all know the story about what's going on there. Of men dominated by lust, captivated under the power of lust, leading to rapes, etc., etc., etc. This was a man dominated by lust. Now, you look at the map here the house of Herod. I want to show you right where they put John the Baptist. And by the way, all of these preachers, including Jesus and the 11 of the 12 true apostles and John were martyred. Every one. You have the house of Herod map. First generation on the left, Herod the Great, and then he has all these sons. And his kingdom is split up. And you notice Galilee and Perea, Perea just to the east of the, of the Jordan River in the Dead Sea. And you look at Perea, how it stretches down, halfway down the Dead Sea at the bottom. There was a fortress called Machaerus there, five miles inland. It was a fortress there. That's where he put John. And he's having a birthday celebration. It's interesting. He holds a, a birthday in his own honor. I, I find that rather peculiar, actually. Um, notice what John had said to him. And this is, by the way, this is what faithful preaching is. It is the proclamation of the gospel, yes, but also the proclamation of the law. Luther understood that well, so did Calvin. It is the preaching of the law and the gospel, the moral demands of God and the solution to the problem of sin in the cross. That's why many people feel uneasy when they hear the proclamation of the law in faithful preaching. But it must be done if people would be saved. You notice what John had done. You talk about a great man. This was, beloved, this was a fearless man. 
The greatest prophet, Jesus said, who ever lived. He knew what was at stake. You notice here in Mark 6, we pick it up in verse 18. And this is what must be done in preaching. This is the role of a preacher, to declare the eternal moral order and to bring that moral order to the consciences of men and women and to point out that we have all sinned. We have all sinned. And he says, because John had said to Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. You are violating the law of God, the eternal standard of God. This is called adultery. Seventh commandment. And you violate the eternal order of God. Well, his wife was a complete devil. You could call her a witch. And she is behind the murder of the great prophet. She is conniving and scheming. She is lower on the scale of ethics than Herod Antipas. She is a devil. Verse 19. Therefore Herodias held it against him and wanted to kill him, and she comes up with a scheme. But she could not, for Herod feared John, knowing that he was a just and holy man, and he protected him. And when he heard him, now Nasby translates this, he was perplexed. He heard him, he was perplexed, he's disturbed. But you notice this, he's, yeah, yeah, you're going to be disturbed when a man says it's something that you're doing is not lawful, that you are in sin. And yet, note the end of verse 20. And this is interesting too, because people can hear a great preacher like John the Baptist and never be saved. The text says, he heard him gladly. This is a great preacher. This, this man is eloquent. Just like the prophets were in the Old Testament. They were eloquent. And people heard them, but were not saved. So there are men who hear preaching and are never converted. He heard him gladly. Well, you know the account. The daughter Salome does an erotic dance. This is a man of lust, and he offers up to half his kingdom to her, and he is the boastful, swaggering man. He can give half his kingdom, still be a powerful man. I'll give you anything. And she got, goes and asks the mother, what should I ask? And we come to the end of verse 24, and she said, the head of John the Baptist. See, this was a scheme. This was a setup. A very conniving, scheming, devilish woman. Evil. And he faces a choice. Will I humble myself now in front of all of my buddies here? And admit that I should not have said this, that I admit that I have done wrong, I spoke inappropriately. Or will I keep my pride and be the big man in the room and execute an innocent man? He decides to keep his pride and lose his soul. And we come to verse 26, and the king was exceedingly sorry. Now, this was the opportunity. He could have played the man. He could have, you know, said, I was wrong. You know, a Christian, a Christian, all of us Christians, will say to others, I was wrong. I'm sorry. That takes some manhood. You gotta play the man. But 
he didn't have the backbone. You notice the language of verse 26. And there are people like this. They, they don't really think about God. They're only concerned about the buddies over here. And it's the buddies who make all the difference. And think about this. These are men made of dust. The Bible says they were made of clay, right? These men are going to be dead in a couple of decades. And you're worried about those men? Yeah, he was. Look at verse 26. The king was exceedingly sorry, yet because of the oaths and because of those who sat with him, these are all of the elites, they sat with him. Yeah, he's worried about their opinions, worried about the opinion of man. He did not want to refuse her. Immediately the king sent an executioner and commanded his head to be brought. And he went and beheaded him in prison, brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl and the girl gave it to her mother. Incredible. But John had those who loved him. And notice how it ends. When his disciples heard of it, they came and took away his corpse and laid it in a tomb. And John the Baptist, beloved, has been in the glory of heaven, a place of joy, felicity, happiness for centuries. I want to end by just calling your attention very quickly, about a minute left. Two contrasting kings. You notice these two kings, how different these men are. On the left, I have Herod Antipas. On the right, Jesus Christ, the great king. And just think about this. You have Herod Antipas, an evil tyrant, Jesus, a loving shepherd. You have Herod Antipas, who gives this banquet in the palace. You have Jesus who gives bread in the wilderness. He feeds the multitude. You have Herod Antipas who destroyed the innocent. You have Jesus who brought life to the lost. You had Herod Antipas who had no mercy. You had Jesus who was overflowing with compassion. You have Herod Antipas who brought sorrow. Jesus who removed all of our misery. Herod Antipas who took the life of others. Jesus who laid down his own life. You know, what was the fundamental problem? Yeah, I know he had lust. Lust is a big problem, but he should have crushed it. By the power of God and the Holy Spirit and the Word of God. He should have put it to death. Do you know what his real problem was? It was his proud heart. Proverbs 16, 18 says, Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Proverbs 25, 15, 25 says, the Lord will destroy the house of the proud. That was his fundamental problem. He's worried about what these guys think. And so he lost his soul. You know what the way of wisdom is? We all know this. The way of wisdom is to make confession. To humble ourselves. To confess, to receive Christ, and to receive eternal life in Him. The way of wisdom, that's what Jesus preached, the apostles preached, John the Baptist preached. Eternal life, freely offered to all who trust in Jesus Christ. Let's pray.